as links in God's prophetic chain. And in Christ Object Lessons, page 65, it says, Not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated by the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth, the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For His church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. Page 65, Christ Object Lesson. So, there's a special work, special truth for each generation, but it's always the same. Right. It's always the same. Now, if you turn to page 13 of your syllabus, The Prophetic Chain, this, I hope this works simple for us. Um, shouldn't be a great deal of preaching involved with this. This is basically trying to outline the structure of this chain. Um, it's, I'm, this, pa this first page here, I'm going repeat to repeat a few times, but I'm going to add some thoughts to it as we go through the, the next pages that are basically a repetition. What we're saying here, I'm on the pop top of page 13, is that there is a 3-1 combination in the Garden of Eden, and that's where Sister White says the first link of the chain is, and that that 3-1 combination is represented by Christ, Adam, and Eve in the Garden. Okay? And we know, as students of prophecy, that after the third way mark, there's a disappointment, so the easy one to see after Christ, Adam, and Eve are illustrated in the Garden is that they're driven out of the Garden. There's the disappointment. And we point to Abel as the fourth way mark in this history, and that's what you see illustrated on page 13. And from there, the next link that we're going to look at, and by the way, as we go through the links of this prophetic chain this week, the week, we are not suggesting that this is every link. We know of other links, and we're sure that there are links that we have not recognized yet. We've just selected the ones to make the points that we want to make. But the me next link that we identify is in the history of Noah, and you have his three sons, <laughs> Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And Noah is the fourth waymark. Okay. And maybe this seems a little bit too simplistic, but as we move through these pages, you'll see that there is really a, a very profound truth that is established by, by putting these in place. Okay. Underneath that, we go to um, Christ and the two angels visiting Abraham. And I don't remember right now. I was going to do that presentation. And I think I took it out and replaced it with another, but I forgot to take it out of this. So we may not deal with Christ and the two angels and Abraham. Maybe we do. Been a busy... <laughs> been busy for a long time, all right? Uh, but, you know, in that story, Abraham's visited by three heavenly visitors, two angels, Christ, Abraham. And, of course, the two angels, they go into Sodom and Gomorrah, and take, take who out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, right? And when they come out of Sodom and Gomorrah, how, what, who goes in to get the, them to come, out of, to come out of Sodom and Gomorrah? It's the second angel's message that calls them out of Babylon. So there's, even if we don't touch on that later on, and I forgot to take it out of there. That's another link in the chain. It's just maybe one of the links we don't deal with here. But we definitely deal with Miriam, Moses, and Aaron. And the fourth there being Joshua. And we'll, we'll try to illustrate the logic why we are picking these personalities and these histories to be the 3-1 combination, which is the link that we're identifying, which makes up the chain of prophetic history. Okay, we follow that with Eli, Hophni, and Phineas, and the fourth being Samuel. And that is a very nice study. Wait till you get to that one. Very serious, but a very nice study. How many have looked at that study from the perspective of the prophetic chain? <coughs> it's a nice study, isn't it? Yes, okay. You guys have looked at it too, but you're not listening to me. You two back there, you're on a different wavelength. Okay, just as you two guys have questioned it, you didn't even know it. <laughs> Okay, and it's followed by Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam. And you might ask why, you might ask why, why Rehoboam instead of Jeroboam? 
and figuring that one out, that also, nice study, is it not? Yeah. Okay, nice study. <laughs> I want to make sure you're here for these studies. They are good, all right? Um, then Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, and you'll notice that the fourth there is Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, he dealt with all three of these kings, right? Okay, it's, it's nice to note. We'll note it at the end. I won't jump ahead. Then we go to Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes again. All right. But underneath them, you can see that Daniel's associated with Cyrus. He's the one that understands the 70 years. Zechariah's in the history of Darius. In Zechariah 2, verse 6 through 10 in there, he calls God's people out of Babylon. Second angel's message, Darius, second decree. And then Ezra is associated with the third decree of Artaxerxes. But Nehemiah secures the fourth decree, which was also in the history of Artaxerxes. But that's the link in that history. And then we go, of course, to the time of Christ where you have John the Baptist, the Sanhedrin, and Christ. It's followed by Pentecost. And underneath those personalities, followed by Pentecost, I have prophecies under them. Daniel 9.25, identifying the baptism of Christ. I'm Exodus 12.3. What's Exodus 12.3? It, it, it's a Passover, but what are they doing there at the Passover? They're selecting the lamb for the Passover, which is what the Sanhedrin was doing when they chose that it was expedient for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish. And then you have Daniel 9.27 when he's in the midst of the week sacrificed at Passover. And then Leviticus 23 is Pentecost. So that's the link in that chain. Um, then we have the three angels' messages in the Millerite history that's followed by the fourth angels' message of our history. Okay? But there's, there's, that is, that's the tricky one to deal with because the third angel's message here at the end of the world, it's accomplished twice. Sister White says the three angels' messages are repeated. I said something here last time I had a brother come up and say, you know, you're saying this wrong. And I, I wasn't going to answer him because I didn't want to contribute to the speaking in here anyway. But it, when it comes to our day and age, we have to come to grips with the fact that the thir three angels' messages are repeated in our history. But it's repeated first for Adventism and then for the world because there's two temple cleansings. Okay? And, and judgment begins with the house of God. The temple cleansing that takes place in Adventism is accomplished through the repetition of the three angels' messages, three tests. Third test, Sunday law. Adventism is dealt with. And then the testing process goes to those outside of Adventism. Second temple cleansing. And you have to put that in place if you're going to deal with the details of the repetition of the three angels' message at the end of the world. Okay, that being said, turn to the, to the next page. We'll go back over these lines of prophecy. What we want to show you here now is that all the links in a chain, they're the same, right? So we put, we've put the, the links in place for you. Now we're going to try to give you the evidence of what spiritual authority we have, what spiritual... Um, reasoning we have that allows us to say these links are the same. And if you notice Adam and Eve and Christ, they're the, the father, mother, creator of mankind. They're the, they're the father of mankind. That that's three way marks in the history of Adam and Eve, they've, Christ created man, Adam and Eve are the mother and father of man. You follow me? Um, and Abel is a family member of that particular family. In the next link <coughs> of Shem, Jabeth, and Ham, they're also the father of mankind, are they not? Yes. Is there any one of us in here that isn't a descendant of Noah? Okay. So it's, they're the same link. They're different, but they're the same link. You see my point? And then the fourth way, Mark, being Noah, he's a family member, just like Abel was a family member. So you see this first 3-1 combination, it's the same as the second links are always the same in the chain, but it's different. Are you with me? Does this, does this seem too, too simple? Or too unimportant? Hang in there, okay. Okay, Christ and the two angels. Um, you got Christ being the creator, the angels being part of the creation, Abraham, family member of that creation. I don't think I deal with that. Um, then you get to Miriam, Moses, and Aaron, still all family members. But here's a switch, a little switch in the link. 
These family members were also the leaders of God's people. Were not Moses, Miriam, and Aaron the leaders of Israel at that time? Now they're at this fourth way mark in this history, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change a little bit. It's still going to be a leader. They were leaders, it's a leader, and it's Joshua. And Joshua isn't so directly a family member. All right. So you can see the first chain matches the second chain and the link. And the second link, it connects with the third, but there's a little bit of changing as you go down through. But they're always the same link, because it's always the 3-1 combination. The next one, Eli, Hophni, and Phineas, family members, in the previous one, those three were all family members. They were all leaders, and Eli, Hophni, and Phineas are leaders. But the fourth way mark was still a leader, but not a family member. That's what it is in this link. Samuel, not a family member of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas, but he's the new leader, right? Are you following the logic here? This is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, right? How many are not following the logic? Okay, that's not enough to spend a great deal of time. You have to, you'll have to do some after, after class <laughs> studies. Okay, the next link is Saul, David, and Solomon. Are, are, are those family members? Yes. In a broad sense, yeah, they're all Israel, okay, 12 tribes. But they're, they're leaders, only, only now they're not really leaders, they're kings. Okay, it's the, the leader element has changed from leadership to more specifically a king. Still leader. It's okay to call Saul a leader, right? But he's a king. And here, the fourth in this history, Rehoboam, once again a king. Alright? Family member. The next is, and by the way, Saul, David, and Solomon, what are they? Yeah. They're the first three kings. And the next link we're looking at are the what? The last three kings. Alright, so there's a connection that way too. Um, so they're, they're family in the sense of they're all Israel. They're still kings of God's people. Only now, the next leader that comes on the scene is Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king. Still a king, still a leader, but a little bit of change. Okay? But still the same because it's still, still simply the 3-1 combination. Everyone with me? Almost. Okay. Um, the next one is sort of three kings. But the way we understand it prophetically, it's more about the decree of these three kings. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes. But it's kings, but it's more about the decrees. It's, it's changing a little bit, but it's still the same. All right, the next is John, the Sanhedrin, and Christ. And these are three prophecies, and Pentecost is a prophecy. Now notice this. What's a decree? A message. What's a prophecy? A message. A message. <laughs> so they're, they're, don't think they're different. They're, they're pretty close to the same. A decree is a prophecy, not a decree of the line of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Uh, it is. A decree is a type of a prophecy. So now they're a little bit different, but they're still the same. Right? Okay, then we get to the end of the 2300 days and we have the three angels what? <laughs> Messages. Prophecies, decrees. They're staying the same, but they're a little bit different. And the fourth, of course, is the fourth angel's message. Okay, let's move one step further and try to put um, the, the disappointments in place. Okay, I don't know why I have Eve there, but in Adam and Eve in Christ... I have for the disappointment Eve, and there's probably some reason at some point in time that Eve made sense, but I think the disappointment there, obviously, and I don't know why I have Eve there, is they were driven out of the garden, right? How disappointing is that? How disappointing was that? No longer get to the tree of life. Okay. And the fourth there we've already spoke about, Abel. Okay, but we're looking at the disappointment. We're putting another way mark into this. The disappointment in the next one of Noah's three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, we have down as Ham. What was disappointing about Ham? I uncovered his father's nakedness. But notice, um, 
in, in the next one, Lot's wife. After this, we're at Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. Then we have what? Well, why is that disappointing? What took place? The unholy fire. They're, they're destroyed before the Lord. And what's Moses tell Aaron? Don't you mourn for this at all. But disappointing, right? Okay, so after these three, in these, in these histories, in these links, there's a disappointment occurring right on time. Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, what's the disappointment? What's Ichabod? Why is it departed? Because they've captured the ark. Because they've captured the ark. Okay. Family member though, right? You notice these, these are uh, family members. That's probably why I had Eve there. But I don't remember the logic there. Saul, David, and Solomon. Jeroboam. Why is Jeroboam, Jer why is Jeroboam the disappointment? He erected the church and down. Everyone know that, right? Why did that take place? Because of Solomon, right? And Solomon, they come to him and say, "Are you going to rule us? Come to Rehoboam. Say, are you going to rule us like your father ruled us?" And what did he say? Yeah, he chastised you with whips. I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. The kingdoms departed, and Jeroboam raises up what? Two golden calves. And when, the, when he makes his pronouncement about the golden calves, who does he quote word for word? Aaron. Aaron, when he did the golden calf. Okay. So, was that a disappointment? Yes, okay. Um, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, they're carried to Babylon. Was that a disappointment? Oh, yeah. All right. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, Sister White tells us that when Ezra saw how few people came out of Babylon on the third decree, he was greatly disappointed. Um, after the cross, the disciples disappointed. 1844, Millerites disappointed. Okay, next page. Now this, this is where, we, this has been pretty simple and straightforward, right? In fact, you could be tempted to think, big deal. All right, perhaps. But this next little this next little truth here that you can recognize in the links of this chain, this identifies the very argument of Adventism today. You know what the argument of Adventism today is? What's the argument of Adventism today? And I and I acknowledge that that the majority of Adventism does not know anything about this argument, but it, that's not going to get them off the hook. All right. There is an argument in Adventism today. That is the argument of 9-11. Did the latter rain begin to sprinkle on 9-11? Did the judgment of the living begin on 9-11? Did the sealing of the 144,000 begin on 9-11? That's the argument, whether an Adventist knows about it or not. Okay, And part of the way that that argument can be defended on the right side of the issue is that in these links of the chain, you will see a change of dispensations. And how many times does it take to see something in the scriptures before it's established? Two or, Two or three. So as you go down through these links of a chain, after you see change of dispensation, change of dispensation, change of dispensation, change of dispensation, when you bring it down to the end of the world, it demands that when you get to the time period of the fourth angel, there has to be a change of dispensation. Whatever Christ was doing in the most holy place before the fourth angel arrives, after he arrives, Christ has to be doing something else. There has to be a change of dispensation based upon this. So here's where this, this simple little illustration, if you will see it, gets sort of serious, all right? Adam and Eve and Christ, where was the focus of worship? Face to face. Face to face, all right? Right? Isn't that what it was? But after sin with Cain and Abel, where was the focus of worship? The gates of the Garden of Eden. And Shem, Japheth, and Ham, the focus of worship is at? The gates of the Garden of Eden. But in the time period of Noah, where's the focus of worship go to? Altars. Okay, then you go to the story of Moses and Miriam and Aram, Aaron, and before that time, where's the focus of worship? 
altars. But in that history, what gets introduced? I got to say it a little bit different to see this. All right, let's say the tent. Did we say the tent? Tent, all right. Tabernacle's good. But some people think, think the, the, built, the permanent building is the tabernacle as well. So, in Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, they're still worshiping at the tent, right? Where at? At Shiloh. So, what's going on at Shiloh in that story? There's a change of dispensation going on. The Lord is, is setting aside the worship at Shiloh, and He's moving it to where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, change of dis dispensation. Are you seeing the change of dispensation? It's not always the focus of worship. Somet sometimes it's where the sanctuary is at. It was at Shiloh. Now it's moving to Jerusalem. Okay. Um, in the time of Saul, David, and Solomon, what gets established? The temple where? Jerusalem. And in that temple, when Solomon finishes the work, what comes into that temple? The glory of the Lord. How, what do we call that? The Shekinah. No, because this, this permanent temple you're going to see in the change of dispensation, sometimes it has a Shekinah and sometimes it doesn't. That's part of the, the evolution. I, it's a good word, but it's a bad word. All right? That's part of the, the progression of this story. All right? um, and in the story of... Solomon, that when it transcends to Jeroboam and Rehoboam, what's happening here? Now, the Lord isn't simply choosing the sanctuary. He's getting specific about the people. Okay, Now he's selecting Judah, the southern two kingdoms, and setting aside the ten northern kingdoms in the story of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So there's a change of dispensation going on here. Ephraim to be exact. Ephraim to be exact. All right. Are you all with me? Are you seeing a change of dispensation in these, in these links? One of the, one of the prophetic characteristics of the 3-1 combination, as it's illustrated as links in this change, is you see a change of dispensations. Therefore, when the fourth angel arrives in history, there will be a change of dispensation. Um, in Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, Jerusalem's being destroyed, the temple's being destroyed, and where are God's people now? Babylon. Babylon. Okay. Is this about the temple? Or about God's people? <laughs> is this about the temple or is this about God's people? In this link. It's about both. Because in the Bible, in the Bible, and we, some, we know this as Adventists, all the theologians will even tell you this one. In the Bible, you cannot separate the sanctuary from God's people. We're seeing God's people getting carried to, God, to Babylon, but we're to understand that has implications for the sanctuary. You cannot separate the sanctuary from God's people in the Bible. It cannot be done. Why was the temple built? That I might dwell among them. You, it, it's, it's, when the temple is, is referenced in the Bible, or God's people are referenced in the Bible, the sanctuary, or the temple, vice versa, is automatically understood. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm going to just step outside this study for just a minute. <laughs> Sisters, this is why if you don't accept and understand the 2520 time prophecy, you cannot give a second witness for 1844. You cannot defend Daniel 814 if you don't uphold the 2520. When truth is established upon the testimony of two. Where's 1844? Well, it's there in Daniel 814. Well, where's your second witness? Gabriel was commanded to come and make Daniel understand. Daniel 8.14, the Mari vision, and what Gabriel does, he gives Daniel a second witness. He says, the last end of the indignation. That's also 18.44. That's the 25.20, the second indignation that ends in 18.44. There's your second witness to 18.44. But it's more than that. Because the answer of Daniel 8.14, unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, is in response to the question of verse 13. How long shall the vision be concerning the daily, 
and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Can't separate them. And uh, 2300 years is telling us when the sanctuary will be made right, justified, cleansed. And the 2520 is telling us when the host will be gathered. You have to gather them both in order to answer the question of Daniel 8.13. And if you don't accept the 2520, then you do not have a second witness for 1844. And the foundation of Adventism is destroyed. But the sanctuary and the host cannot and never is separated in the scriptures. So when we see the sanctuary moving in these change of dispensations or when we see God's people moving in these histories, it's also representing a change of dispensation. Okay? So they're carried to Babylon and they come out of Babylon to do what? Rebuild the temple. Nehemiah finishes Jerusalem. And, pardon me? You've lost me. No sound. You think it's me? I don't think it's me. Keep going. All right. So they're in Babylon. Under Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, there's going to be change in dispensation. God's people are going to come out of Babylon, and they're going to rebuild the temple. And this temple is a little bit different. Why? No Shekinah in this one. A little bit different. Right? And this, this the Jer Jerusalem's finished under Nehemiah, and then the next link is John the Baptist, Christ, followed by Pentecost. And we still see the temple there. We see God's people there. No Shekinah in this temple, but what do we have in this temple? Christ. We have the Shekinah. <laughs> we have Christ. It's the glory that fills this house is, is Christ. So, all these histories are dealing with the focus of worship, the change of worship. But each of these three one combinations, there is illustrated a change of dispensation. Do you see that? Okay, this is pretty, pretty basic, but this is pretty serious. Okay, when you get to the three angels' messages in 1844, is there a change of dispensations? From what? The holy to the most holy. So if all the links in the chain, if all of them in the three one combinations are identifying a change of dispensations, and what are all the prophets speaking about? The end of the world. They're speaking about the time period of the latter reign. In that last link, are we to suppose that part of the story doesn't have anything to do with the change of dispensation? No. We're to, we're to understand definitely that to understand that last history of the fourth angel, that you have to see a change of dispensation between the work of Christ in the sanctuary and Christ's people. That's why. That's why last night. I hope everyone got that last night. That was profound, man. Bring all the Adventism into the most holy place. Set all those rods in there and it's only Levi that buds out because the latter rain's falling on it. Okay. When's the latter rainfall? Acts 3.19. The time period when you send your sins beforehand into judgment. In order to send your sins beforehand into judgment to receive the refreshing, you got to be alive. Latter rain comes in the judgment of the living. There has to be a change of dispensation in the fourth angel. And there is. And this is one way you can show it. Is by showing the prophetic chain. Okay. What we're going to look at this week, by the way, this is just part two of the introduction. If you take the third way mark, brothers and sisters, the third way mark is judgment, right? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. In the time of Christ, what's the third way mark? The cross. In the time of Moses, what's the third way mark? Passover. So, without any further illustrations, you know when, if you were to take all those third way marks and bring them together, you would be telling the most profound presentation on the cross that you've ever heard. You can even just take the disappointments. You can talk about being driven out of the garden, about Ham, about being carried to Babylon. You can just take the way marks of the disappointment and bring them down here to the end of the world in order to try to understand the disappointment that God's people are about to be thrown into. Okay, but what we're going to do this week is we're going to take link number four. 
because we're living in the time period of the perfect fulfillment of that fourth way mark. So we want to take the light of those links and shine it on the here and now. That's the purpose of this study. So the ones we'll be covering are under the fourth way mark here, Abel, the everlasting gospel. And brothers and sisters, I'm convinced, I am totally convinced, that Adventism doesn't understand what the gospel is. Even those people in Adventism that understand correctly what justification, sanctification, victorious Christian living, uh, the nature of Christ, the nature of man, even those people that are preaching that correctly, most of them don't understand what the everlasting gospel is. Because brothers and sisters, the everlasting gospel is the gospel. This is the definition of it. If you want to try to show me where I'm wrong, give it your best shot. The everlasting gospel is the gospel that produces two classes of worshipers based upon their response to a prophetic message Amen. that's delivered to them. Amen. That's the everlasting, that, that's, that's Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. That's Cain and Abel. They were given a prophetic testing message. And it had to do with true or false worship. They were given a prophetic testing message and one class demonstrated that it rejected the increase of knowledge. Who was that class? Cain. Cain. And what they place on Cain? The mark, the mark of the beast. <laughs> what about Abel? What did Abel do? He cried out, didn't he? His blood cries out. He's the one that gives the loud cry, is he not? Okay. That's the everlasting gospel. Two classes of worshipers produced by the introduction of a testing prophetic message. We don't understand that in Adventism. That's illustrated in Cain and Abel, the first, the first of the fourth way mark. What's that tell you? Did you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying the everlasting gospel is illustrated, illustrated by Cain and Abel, and the first link in the prophetic chain is the Adam, Eve, Christ, disappointment being driven out of the garden and the fourth way mark is Cain and Abel which illustrate the everlasting gospel. Why is that important? It's for a lot of reasons. Because, because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And upon the rule of first mention, the first time something's mentioned in the scriptures, it's the most important. The story of the everlasting gospel is the most important aspect of the fourth angel's message. Amen. Amen. And the everlasting gospel is the gospel that produces two classes of worshipers based upon how they respond to the introduction of a prophetic message. And let any other man that preaches any other gospel than this be accursed. And when Paul says that, he says it twice to make sure that it is established. We don't understand that in Adventism. We're going to look at Noah and as the fourth way mark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth being the three. Noah the fourth. And when you look at Noah as the fourth way mark and you bring it down to the end of the world, you got the covenant. You got the outpouring of the rain. You have the shut door. You got lots of stuff in there about our day and age. That's what we're going to do with these number four way marks. Follow the logic? This is still an introduction. We, Pastor Carrasco launches us onto the study next. Okay? You can see how I've summarized these fourth way marks on page 17 and then I put them in a run-on sentence to just kind of summarize what the fourth angel's message is all about based upon the prophetic chain. You with me? Am I getting a little bit too vague? Okay, now let's move on to the next point. Under 490 years. This is a fun one. Okay. We're going to deal with this. What we're going to start here, we're going to deal with later in more detail. But we want to stimulate your sanctified curiosity. All right. Acts 13, verses 16 to 20. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. 
The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm, he brought them out of it. And about the time of how many years? Forty, forty years. About the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years. So this is, this is Pentecost here, right? Or not Pentecost. This is Passover. From the time, how does Paul say it? Um, and about the time of 40 years, he suffered their manners in the wilderness. So this is Passover. This is 40 years, right? Right? Everyone with me? Um, so Passover... It's preceded by Pharaoh resisting the work. Passover is a third way mark, right? Moses represents the first way mark. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Okay. And this, this is Pentecost, the fourth way mark. So what we're looking at, it begins with a link. It begins with a 3-1 combination, all right? And Paul's telling us from Passover, when they came out of Egypt, 40 years, and then he suffered with them 450 years during the time of the judges, which equals 490 years to Samuel. And what does Samuel do, among other things? He anoints Saul. Okay? And Saul is the first king. Who's the second king? Who's the third king? Which king built the temple? Third king. <laughs> third king builds a temple upon three kings. Jehoiakim. Kim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the temple is destroyed. Is that not right? Nebuchadnezzar came against three kings. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, three kings. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when he comes against Zedekiah, the last king, the temple is destroyed. So notice, temple built by third king, temple destroyed by third king, and when they rebuild the temple, they rebuild it on the decree of which king? Third king. I think that's an accident? No, no accidents in God's word. All right. Now, um, what do we have this? Ah, okay. When they choose Saul, someone... I heard a presentation today from someone, I think it was. When they chose, when the children of Israel decided they wanted Saul as a king, what did they do? They were rejecting God. And you have this, we have this here from 1 Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel at Ramah, Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of thy people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So when you get here, which is what Paul says, 490 years from, from Passover to Samuel, Israel rejects God. Right? Okay. So from the first king here, Saul, unto the last king, Zedekiah, how many years? 490 years. Right? You have a quote from uh, Clark's commentary there. Think that's an accident? What is 490 years? It's probationary time. Um, Matthew 18, 21 and 22, under probationary time. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall thy brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times but unto 70 times 7. 490 years is a time of probation. Right? You see it? Now, in Daniel 9.24, it says 70 weeks, 490 years, are determined. And what's this Hebrew word determined mean? Cut off. Cut off, Cut off from what? <laughs> Cut off from the 2300 years. Okay, this is the 2300. And it begins with a 490 year prophecy for Israel. What happens at the end of the 490 years? Is Stephen is stoned, Michael stands up, probation closes, right? Probation closes when Michael stands up. 
This, this 490 years in the scriptures represents a probationary time. And there's 490 years from Israel coming out of Egypt and entering into covenant with the Lord until they reject the Lord at the time of Samuel. And then there's 490 years from the first king to the last king. And in here, we have a 70 year period. And I, I never thought this through before I did this. We have a 70 year period here, right? Yeah. That leads to the beginning of the 2300 years. And in the beginning of the 2300 years, we have this 490 years. Do, where else do we see the 70 years? 70. Years. 70. Where else do we see the 70 years? I mean, we're looking at 490, 490, 490, but where else do we see the 70? Uh, we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that towards the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'll blow your mind where the, the, the 70 years is. At least it blows my mind. But anyway, we'll keep, keep on point here. This 70 years, what is this 70 years about? For the land By the way, how many, how many in here have been Seventh-day Adventists over 10 years? Okay, you look around. Almost everyone in here has been an Adventist over 10 years. How, now, how many of you knew, as Seventh-day Adventists, that it was on the third king that the temple was built and that it was on the third king that the temple was destroyed, and that it was on the third king that the temple was rebuilt. How many knew that? Okay. See one hand. Now, my, my, the reason I ask that question is, you would think we would know this, right? Isn't this prophecy here the foundation of Adventism? It begins with the third decree, the third king. You would think, as good students of prophecy, as Seventh-day Adventists, that the foundational truth of Adventism, that we would understand that this third king has been prefigured by this third king and has been prefigured by this third king. But here we are at the end of the world, and we don't really even understand the foundation of Adventism, which is the 2300 days. Brothers and sisters, even if you don't understand the implications of this, just at the surface level, the fact that Solomon builds the temple, he's the third king, and that there are three kings that stand to get Nebuchadnezzar, and the last one being Zedekiah is where the temple's destroyed. And then Artaxerxes, the third king, is the one that allows the temple to be built and the 2300 years to begin. You've got to see that's connected somehow, some way, to the 2300 years, don't you? <laughs> but here we are at the end of the world, and we don't know that as Seventh day Adventists, even those of us that have been Adventists for a very long time. Right? Why? It's been sealed up. Okay, <laughs> it's been sealed up. All right. So maybe there's more that we, maybe there's more to the 2300 days that we don't understand. I want to, I want to try to show um, one other thing. Go to Daniel 9 2 in your book on page 18 about the 70 years. We're familiar with Daniel 9 2, right? In the first year of the reign, of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the destruction of Jerusalem. Here's a test question for those of us. In the first year of whose reign? Cyrus, okay. The first year of Cyrus. Who's Cyrus? <laughs> Cyrus, who'd Cyrus slay? Belshazzar. Ah, Belshazzar, okay. Cyrus is the, the one that comes in and brings to a conclusion Babylon. Now go to Jeremiah 25, 12. Okay, this is where Daniel says he understood the 75, the 70 years. And on your handouts on page eight, 18 where it says the punishment of Babylon, it starts in verse 9 of Jeremiah 25. It says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all the nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the sound of the millstones and the light of the candles. You know why I have those bold face there? 
That's a symbol of the close of probation in the Bible. And we're supposed to understand that. You know why we're supposed to understand that? You know why I know we're supposed to understand that? Because that's the, the phraseology that John uses in Revelation 18 in the, in the last two verses. And Sister White says of Revelation 18, we should carefully understand, er, study every verse of Revelation 18, especially the last two. And this is a, is a phrase that represents the close of probation. And it continues on. It says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. So when Daniel see, marks the seventy years, what he understood, what he tells us about the seventy years is that this marks the time that God's people are to come out of Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem in the temple. But when Jeremiah is refer referencing the 70 years, what's he tell us? He tells us a little more. He says, he tells us when the 70 years are over. When are the 70 years over? Pa pardon me? At the end of Babylon. Someone said it down there. Well, the, 70 years, the 70 years ends when Babylon is punished. Where does the 70 years begin? When Jerusalem's destroyed. Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. One kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, comes to an end. It marks the beginning of the 70 years and it ends when a kingdom comes to its end. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. The 70 years ends with the destruction of Babylon, right? Okay, so there's, there's more to this history than meets the eye. In fact, if you read on further, at this point, what's Jeremiah given? He's given a cup, isn't he? He's giving a cup. He says, go to the nations and make them drink, and they will drink. Who drinks first? God's people. God's people. Judgment begins in the house of God. Okay? So, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. What do we know about this in the end of the world? Number one, judgment's going to begin at the house of God. But... Ezra adds some of this, adds some light to this. Ezra, next page, chapter 19. He talks about the 70 years too. Second Chronicles 36, 16 to 20. 21. I'm just going to drop down to the last verse because I'm running out of time. All right? Verse 21. On the last verse, under the resting land, it says, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. And he's quoting Jeremiah just like Daniel's quoting Jeremiah, all right? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill how many? Years. Seventy years. Ezra's telling us the seventy years is to let the land rest for seventy years because Israel hadn't let the land rest every seventh year. So this 70 years punishment, what's it, what's it in response to? It's easy. The land was supposed to rest every seventh year, was it not? So this, this 70 years punishment was in direct relationship to this 490 years of disobedience, was it not? Okay, now you've got you to gotta watch. You've got to see this. Where is Ezra... When Ezra is making this application about the 70 years, what is he basing it on? What's he basing it on? What's he basing it on? Pardon me? Leviticus 25, right? Leviticus 25 is where the statutes of letting the land rest every seven years is set forth. And the statute of letting the land rest the 50th year after seven cycles of seven. That's Leviticus 25, is it not? And it goes on to say that during the Jubilee time, when you're letting the land rest on the 50th year in commemor commemoration of the seven, seven periods, that in that 50th year, it gives you rules about how you are to relate to the land. Because you don't own the land. We don't own the land, according to Le Leviticus 25. Who owns the land? And you're given the land at the beginning of the 50 years, and I can be just a foolish steward, and at the end of the 50 years, I don't have my land anymore. You have my land, because you were a good steward. But at the end of the 50 years, what do you got to do? You got to give me the land back. I might, have, I might even been more foolish than that. I might have had to sell myself into bondage to you. But we're both Jews, right? 
So at the end of the 50 years, what do you have to do? Give me back, okay? Leviticus 25 is the rules of the letting the land rest and the jubilee and all the rules that are connected with it. And today in Adventism, we say this old farmer was wrong about this 2520 because the Hebrew in Leviticus 26, where it's translated as seven times, it doesn't have Leviticus 26, where it's translated as seven times, possesses no numerical value. And William Miller did not have the biblical authority to derive a numerical understanding from the words seven times in Leviticus 26 because the Hebrew that's translated into seven times in Leviticus 26 does not possess a numerical element as the word times, the different Hebrew word that is translated as times in the book of Daniel does. But William Miller never says, I base the 2520 on the Hebrew of Leviticus 26. William Miller says, I base the seven times of Leviticus 26 on the context that is set forth in Leviticus 25. Amen. If you let the land rest on the seventh year, I will bless you. If you will let the land rest on the fiftieth year after seven cycles of seven, I will bless you. But if you don't, then you're going to have seven times punishment. And William Miller, the old farmer, he says by the context of it, this seven times must have a numerical value because it's based upon the sacred cycle of seven that's there in Leviticus 25. And I don't know why William Miller would be wrong because that's exactly what Ezra did in 2 Chronicles 36:21. He says that 70 years is based upon letting the land rest. And that comes from Leviticus 25. Ezra is making his application of the 70 years based upon the context of Leviticus 25 and 26. Just like William Miller. I suppose Ezra didn't understand the Hebrew, too. <laughs> Brothers and sisters. The same angel that directed Daniel and John directed William Miller. It's about the context. But we don't understand that because we don't understand the 70 years. And we, and we don't understand the 70 years is in response to this 490 years and this 490 years, but we are the ones that understand the 2300 years. Are we? Are we? Okay. Let's, uh, I have just a couple minutes. Make sure that we plugged all these things in place. That's probably enough information. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, there is a chain, the prophetic chain. At the beginning of Adventism, the Lord led William Miller to understand the commencement point of the, of the chain. Okay? You don't see it on these charts. You don't see it on these charts. But go to Leviticus 25, not in your notes, go to Leviticus 25. I'm done, this isn't in your notes, but this is also one little nice tidbit to throw into this before we close. In Leviticus 25, when Moses is setting forth these statutes of the sacred cycle of seven, in verse 9 of Leviticus 25, start in verse 8. Everyone there? If you're there, say amen. Okay. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement. When does the Jubilee trumpet sound? Because of that, see, this is, this is where William Miller started, was on the 2520, and William Miller tells us that he, he, he's dealing with the 2520 time prophecy of Leviticus 26 based upon Leviticus 25. So although it's not on these charts, the Millerites believed that Daniel 8.14 was identifying the Day of Atonement, but they did not understand what the Day of Atonement was correctly. They thought it was the end of the world. But nevertheless, they were marking it as the Day of Atonement, and they knew from Leviticus 25 
that on the Day of Atonement, what was going to happen? The sounding of the Jubilee trumpet. That's what we just read. When you're going to sound the Jubilee trumpet, you sound it on the Day of Atonement. So although it's not on these charts, the Millerites taught this. That when Jerusalem was destroyed, it began the Great Jubilee Cycle. And the Great Jubilee Cycle for the Millerites was 49 years of Jubilee Cycles. And what's a Jubilee Cycle? It's 50 years. Okay. The 50th year you celebrate the Jubilee. So they went like this. And they said, from 606, 605, of course, they were thinking 1843, we're going to make a correction for them. We're going to say 1844, that you had 49 cycles of Jubilee. It's not on the chart, but still works, airtight. And the reason that they were doing that is because they were saying that the 2300 year prophecy was the Day of Atonement. Okay? Yeah, if they hadn't taught it, I wouldn't be teaching. <laughs> I wouldn't have discovered this. <laughs> but, now, you notice, brothers and sisters, uh, we've been studying the number 46 in this message for a while, right? Moses is 46 days on the mount to receive instruction on how to build the temple. The temple during Christ's time period, how long did it take for them to build Herod's temple? You know why I'm saying it that way? I'd never say it that way. Because there wasn't any historical evidence to actually show a construction in the time of Christ of 49 years to build a temple. People have looked, but they never found it until about two weeks ago. A, a brother in England named Parminder has the evidence that the building of the temple took 49 years in the time of Christ. If you mark the conclusion of that building at the first temple cleansing which is exactly where John 2.20 is at, when the Jews says this temple took 49, 46 years, 46 years to build, okay? 46 years for Moses to receive instruction for building the temple. The Jews say it took 46 years to build that temple, and we know that from 1798 to 1844, the Millerite temple was erected in 46 years. And how many chromosomes in a human body? 46, all right? Are we not the temple of the Lord? Okay, but that's not what I want to get at. Okay? If, we, if you divide 2450, the Jubilee cycle, by the Jubilee cycle of 50, it equals 49. But if you divide the 2300 by the Jubilee cycle, it equals 46. So brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, that the light that the angel Gabriel led William Miller to is light that is still shining for Amen. anyone that cares to look at it. Amen. All right? And that I'm also here to tell you that God's people at the end of the world don't even understand a small part of Daniel 8.14, which is the foundation of Adventism. We're standing here at the end of the world in our Laodicean condition, refusing to return to these foundational truths, and we don't really even have a second testimony for Daniel 8.14. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we know that in the Millerite history you erected a temple from 1798 to 1844 in fulfillment of 2 Peter. And you erected that temple that you could suddenly come into it and enter into covenant with it in 1844. And we know that that history is being repeated in our day and age. But we know that time is no longer. But we understand that you're doing a work of erecting a people now to enter into covenant with and we wish to be among those people. We understand that you gave us a, a foundational message that began with the commencement points of a prophetic chain and we can recognize now that you are bringing this chain into perfect um, visibility for all who wish to see it. And as we continue in our consideration of this prophetic chain, we ask that the Holy Spirit would 
teach us the implications of these, these truths as they impact the day that we're living in. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels, and we ask for that continued presence throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.